globally. Um, uh, of course, Africa as a continent has an overwhelmingly uh, young uh, population that needs to be uh, educated and equipped with the uh, life skills and uh, technical skills and know how to be able to carry uh, all of our countries forward um, in the coming years. I think I read somewhere that uh, every month um, 18 million uh, young Africans uh, enter the workforce. Now, if they're not only going to be sort of getting joining the migration route and trying to get uh, out of Africa, we've got to give them uh, the skills so they can create businesses, they can open uh, um, educational facilities, uh, technology, um, to be able to create jobs here for future generations. And um, we're joined, we're very lucky this week to be joined by someone who can really answer that essential question about how we can educate uh, African children uh, so they can compete globally by Mary Apia Ashun. So Mary is a headmistress of Ghana uh, International School in Ghana. The school was started actually, I believe, in 1956, the year before uh, Ghana's uh, independence. Um, it currently has uh, 1,400 uh, students. They start from as young as three years old, and of course they go up to uh, 18 uh, years old. Um, uh, they follow uh, the English uh, national uh, curriculum and uh, are part of uh, the examination board is at Cambridge University Exams Board. Um, and the website for anyone who's interested for the school is uh, GIS, which of course stands for Ghana International School, dot edu dot gh. So that's uh, GIS. Uh, dot edu dot gh. Um, Mary uh, herself has uh, been uh, an educator uh, uh, on two continents, uh, both uh, in the US and of course in Africa, and uh, she herself has been educated here in the UK where I am, the United States, uh, Ghana of course, and uh, Canada. So welcome Mary. Thank you very much. Thanks so much for having me. It's a, it's a real pleasure. So the first question, uh, uh, Mary, um, which has been sent in, is uh, when I read it, it's quite a, it's quite a, in some ways, stark and um, I suppose you could say sort of a sobering uh, statistic. It says that according to a UNESCO study in 2012, so that's the United Nations Education, Science and Cultural Organization, UNESCO, a UNESCO study in 2012 showed that the number of primary aged children not attending school in Africa, so all the kids who could be and should be in primary school but who are not in Africa, accounted for more than half of the global total, um, which is an incredible statistics. So the first question is, what are the challenges to reversing this trend? Wow, that's such a broad question, but a, a really good one to start off with. As you mentioned, the starkness of it all just really highlights the urgency with which you know we need to act. And uh, the first thing I would say is that ironically, the number one challenge in reversing this trend um, is the lack of education um, in those who would want to send the children to school, who have the responsibility of sending the children to school. So. Uh, we do know that an appreciation for the value of education drives parents or caregivers to have their children educated. Um, and so the lack of education and those parents or caregivers is one of the reasons why it's, it's becoming even more difficult to reverse this trend. Uh, the second thing is a continuing population growth. I'm not an expert on population growth, but I know that we're still making babies faster than everyone else around the world. Mm -hmm. And although the rate has slowed down just a little bit, um, we're, we're still making babies way too fast. And mm -hmm. so um, if that can be tackled as well, I know that uh, the World Health Organization and other organizations are doing a lot to try to um, reduce this, um, but it is uh, a problem. Uh, the next one I would say is urbanization, uh, movement into crowded, overcrowded cities because of unemployment in rural areas. Uh, means that there are children on the streets not being educated. Here in Ghana, you're, um, you're driving in the streets. It doesn't matter what time of day it is. And it's horrifying to see children as young as three or four uh, leading uh, a supposed blind person or a handicapped person and, and, and begging for money or food by the roadside. And it always hits me because I wonder, why aren't you in school? You know, and who is this adult who is letting you be out of school and is is uh, is forcing you to 
guiding them to go around. So that urbanization and the people to move into the cities, these people are homeless, their children end up being homeless. And then government, of course, you know, our governments know education is crucial, but the continuing chaos of how education is being done indicates that the right people aren't being asked or allowed to make the necessary contributions to rectify the problem. And of course, corruption, corruption at all levels. And it's really sad when you think uh, of the fact that even within education, corruption exists. Because you think to yourself, at least for me, school should be one of the most peaceful places on earth. It should be a place that is really rid of all of these things. But there's still so much corruption within uh, education circles. And until something is done about that, uh, it's going to be very difficult to reverse the trend because that person procreating, you know, by some roadside in Accra has no inkling of what that, that child uh, is going to be exposed to once that child is born. In fact, they don't think about it at all. Yeah. You know, so I think that that's what makes it very, very stark. It's interesting. I mean, uh, the the image you um, you point out of you know the 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 impact of uh, urbanization and seeing children out of uh, school, <clears throat> maybe sort of working in markets or you know um, you know working uh, with with adults is is an image you see you know in the four corners of of the continent. I mean, of course, not just in Ghana but everywhere, Kenya, Botswana. You know, it's it's a uh, it's one of the sort of key. Uh, you know, uh, get out in any African town or city, and and you'll see that. You know, whether it's French speaking, English speaking, Swahili speaking, or uh, whatever, it's uh, it's really quite uh, quite stark. Um, but I mean, people will be shocked to to, to hear you say that uh, corruption or transparency is an issue in uh, in uh, education. I mean, how is it? Is it in the state system? Because obviously, every year there are contracts for sort of books and supplies. Is is, is that where it comes in? Yeah, it's in the smallest places, actually. You know. You wouldn't have before teachers get paid, it's going to go through a certain process along the way. There's money being siphoned off. The teachers who haven't been paid for months, you know, and, and you wonder how come you haven't been paid, but the government says that they've dispersed the money. Um, and it goes through just different stages before it gets to that person who actually deserves it. They've been working for it. So, invariably, you'll have some teachers who won't see the point of being in class if they've been working for about two, three weeks with without being paid for the month. It really begs the question, why should I be there when I could be in the marketplace selling fabric and actually making money on the spot for selling the fabric? Mm -hmm. You know, so while the children are sitting outside or, or hanging about on the streets, if you were to go into one of these typical classrooms in one of these rural areas, there's actually nothing going on. So mm -hmm. the child who's there is really there because they like the thought of school, their friends are there, but there's no teacher in the classroom, mm. you know? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Very process. interesting. Yeah. Let me, I mean, it brings us on to the second point, uh, Mary, which leads on to this, um, you know, this whole pres question of sort of, you know, corruption and, and you know, which is mm. the sort of the role of the, of, of the government. <laughs> so, you know, given how big the problem is and how urgent the problem is, as you say, you know, uh, more and more, you know, children are, are coming into the education system because we have, you know, on the continent, you know, very high sort of birth rates. It's putting a lot of stress on the system. Are mm. governments or is the government, you know, doing enough uh, in on, on education, do you think? <laughs> That's a loaded question. Um, but I'll say no, <laughs> the government isn't doing enough. No government does enough. Mm. <laughs> this is not just in Ghana. I mean, if you were to go to the best systems in the world, I mean, in the UK, look at what teachers are going through with Ofsted and this big, big and that. Problem. You know, big problem. Um, big, big problem. And I, I don't think governments can ever do enough. And I, I think that it's unfair to also expect that governments will do everything. All right. So you can never do enough on education. I think all you can do is to keep revisiting the systems that you have in place, evaluate them in light of trends and the data garnered from the keeping. And it's a continuous side. I think that if governments were to be able to prove that this is what we're doing by continuing to review to say what they are doing, but until they have that system of evaluating themselves, I don't think we can even be close to saying that. 
uh, because we change systems willy nilly. You know, here in Ghana, we had a three year undergraduate, then it went to four years. I have no clue what it is right now. Sometimes I think it's three, sometimes it's four. Most people don't finish within the allotted time. In North America, it's the same thing. You know, you apply to universities and colleges, they say it's a four year program. Most students are finishing in five to six years. You know, but at least outside Africa and outside Ghana, uh, it's stable. But with each successive government, we have some new project, some new idea. And whether what, what we were used to has been reviewed, has been evaluated so that we can say, okay, this one was really not working because of this data. Now, if the data is there, right, then it's not being shared well, right? Because <laughs> right. your typical Ghanaian who is capable of understanding data will not be able to tell you why the government switched from this to that, you know? So there's a communication problem there. Um, so I think that if governments were to be able to do uh, more long-term studies, actually base their decisions on data that has been gathered over years, look at systems around the world. I'm not saying that um, we need to pick whatever is happening in another country and immediately come and plop it here. But then you look at what's working outside and then you ask yourself, how could that work in here? How can we study that? Maybe set up some model institutions, study that over a period of time, use that data to come up with some decisions and then give yourself some time. And some of these decisions must be sort of immune from, um, from government changes. So if a new government comes, could we just stick to what we were doing before? Maybe set up your own task force to um, review what was being done instead of thinking, okay, what they were doing was utterly crap and so let's leave it alone we've got our own idea and then we start off all over again and then you throw it all off in a tizzy i remember when i was doing my a levels i think just after the a levels probably a year or so before my time um there was some sort of a blip in the system and so instead of us having to do um, a two-year national service after university we had to do one year before university and one year after. Right. This was so that we could, um, what's the right word to use? Not get absorbed, but there was a one year lag that had to be mm. taken care of. All right? right. So clever that they split the national service that way so we could do one year before and one year after. And in fact, for me, um, I, I did my one year national service at a primary school. I taught um, year two. In a primary school, I never thought I wanted to be a teacher, but I thoroughly enjoyed the experience and then probably chucked it because nobody ever thought that um, we could probably use that experience to try to get some students who had never thought about teaching or any other profession possibly into that profession. But I'm just saying that when governments come and go, yeah, they just keep changing stuff and we need to be stable for a bit and allow um, some of our changes to be built on, on, on data. So is there no long-term plan, you think, for education in Ghana that, that doesn't get, you know, changed with each successive administration? So what you're saying is there's a habit in which a government will come and say, look, this is the way forward. And then there'll be another government say, no, we think that's rubbish. We're, we're going to change it. There's no 20, 30 year plan to say, look, this is where we want to go to. And you just change it a bit at the edges. Yeah, there is. There is one there. Um, I think that, you know, it gets tweaked by mm -hmm. each government, of course, but every so often we get not really a tweak, we get a major shift. And mm -hmm. it's as if when we get that major shift, we haven't studied it enough, that's what it seems like, to put um, supports in place to handle that shift that has happened, but there is a major plan. You go on the Ministry of Education's website, Ghana Education Service, we're really great at putting papers together, mm. you know, but implementation, and it's in realizing that a lot of these things have far reaching consequences. And so before there's that major shift, that's fine, but this other government did this, maybe you didn't quite like it, but how could we make it better? Mm. Um, we don't get the sense that each su successive government is trying to support whatever is in place already and maybe conducting studies to allow changes to be made instead mm. it's that we don't want this we never liked it when it was voted in mm. and so we are going to change it that's what it mm. seems like but there is a plan in place for sure 
do you think, Mary, I mean, I'll move on to the third question, but you're, you're raising a lot of very interesting points and, and I'm sure, you know, a lot of the people on the, on the session will, will view. I mean, I'm from sort of East Africa, from sort of uh, Somaliland, but, you know, I've worked all over sort of Africa, West, Central, South, you know, East. And, you know, culturally, as, as, as much as, you know, there are a lot of differences between continents, but as Africans, we have a common, you know, a common, you know, approach to sort of life. And, and, and if I could generalize broadly, there is within the sort of African tradition, you know, with our parents, they want children to follow academic things, you know, be a lawyer, be a doctor, be an engineer. You know what yeah. I mean? That yeah. Obviously means going to university is a big, you know, thing of pride, you know, with the family and so forth. Do you yeah. think that there's a, uh, I wouldn't say snobbiness, but do you think there's a real, there's a realism that, some people must go to university, but for others, they have to be what the Germans describe as, you know, like apprenticeships. You know, you need to teach people who are not going to go through to university that may finish school at 16, that might be mechanics or might be, uh, I don't know, you know, um, uh, working as waiters or work in the service economy that, you know, do we have that approach or is it still very much the view that only going to university is good enough? We still are of the view that university is the holy grail. Yeah. If you don't go to university... And that's a problem, isn't it? That's a problem because you can't send everyone to university. Exactly. And not everyone should go. No, not everyone is meant to go. Yeah. You know, and the way that universities are, structures and, uh, are structured and learning is structured is not for everyone. You know, mm. and so I think um, uh, early on when I was looking at some of the questions, I, I, I wanted to, to speak to this because how we even teach, how we teach, how we measure learning, right, really forces some people out of the system way earlier than they need to be, right, because we, we all learn so differently. And we are not trained or the teachers aren't trained well enough to be able to say, okay, this child is verbally strong. This child is spatially strong. They should go in that area. They should go in that area. This child is really good at, at working with their hands. But I don't blame the parents too much. You know, there's a lack of education on it. But I think it's the economy. You know, when they look around and they ask themselves, who's doing what? You know, is it the person who said, I'm not going to, I'm going to be a plumber? You know, that's not the person who's doing well. But the person who's doing well is the one who went to university. You know, yeah. so that's what we're looking at. But, but a very good yeah, plumber so these went to university. is very much needed. <laughs> Very, very much needed. So I think it's driven by an industrial, mm. an industrial revolution, you know, so to speak. And we are yeah. still in that state okay. because if you were to North America and, and in the UK um, and in other um, uh, developed parts of the world, um, a plumber, let me just use Canada because that's what I know. A plumber could be making 80 to to $100 an hour. Yeah. They come over to your house, your dishwasher is not working. Mm. And it could be just some little check, check, yeah. check, you know, clean event here, event mm -hmm. there. But they're there for like 10 minutes and that's within the hour. So you get billed a hundred bucks. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And yeah. I could be... I mean, uh, the, room, the, room, the, room, the room I'm talking to you from now, there's a little balcony. We had a leak yeah. and it went through to my kitchen. And uh, two guys, they weren't even British. They were Polish, you know, uh, uh, you know builders and, uh, and uh, carpenters. You know, they mm. took the thing out, they fixed it. I had to pay nearly $1,500, and that was six days' work. Yeah, there you go. But you see, you that can't happen here. Mm. That can't happen here. So there's not one parent who will say, um, you know what, I don't want my children going for these extra lessons to get into university because I'd like them to be a plumber. Yeah. You know, I'd like them to be an electrician. So until our economy grows and expands mm. enough, to, to cause people to look differently. And I'll give you a stark example. When we were children, if you were playing football outside for more than, let's say, half an hour, an hour, you'd get walloped. You yeah. know, get inside, get your books, sit down, study, and so on. Well, now footballers are making way more than some engineers could ever imagine in their lives. So Definitely. parents are looking for football academies to send their children to because they've seen where the money comes from and yeah. where the stability will be. And they are, they're telling themselves, in retirement, I want, I, I want to be stable enough. I want my children to be able to be stable enough to look after me. And yeah. so if they're really good at sport, why not encourage them in sports? You know, 
So you can see that happening. We tend to go where the money is. And this yeah. is why teaching is so unattractive. If you do not pay teachers well, you're yeah. not going to get the best ones going yeah. there. Yeah. And I think yeah. that's coming up in one of the questions there. But yeah. it's something that I've really focused on. And, and the approach that I've been using at GIS is not to say, let your child go be a plumber or a, um, yeah. an electrician or whatever. Yeah. All I'm saying is, what's your child good at? Yeah. Because what they're good at, they're going to make yeah. tons of money at it. Yes. What yeah. are they good at? And don't force them. I mean, how many people do we know who are accountants and lawyers who absolutely hate what they're doing? Lots. And if, yeah. And if you were to ask them, what would you rather do? I'd much rather mm. be a journalist. I'd much rather yeah. be a hairdresser with some salons and, yeah. and so on. And their creativity there, but they've been forced into a field that doesn't quite work for them. And they'll, they'll be making a living, but they are patently unhappy. Yeah. Okay. Life is Life is like that, you're right. Okay, let's let's go to the third question that's been sent in, uh, Mary. And the third question yeah. is, is, is this. <laughs> Regarding quality and equality issues in education in Ghana, what is your definition of the term quality? Are there baseline indicators by which education in Africa can be benchmarked against other international standards? And is there a body benchmarking education, uh, you know, within uh, Africa and globally? Um, that is such a broad question because I mean, quality education, it's so, it's so contextual, I think, mm. um, what one would say is quality in one part of the world. I mean, I was just watching a video today that I've seen millions of times and mm. it's about, I think it's about the Finnish system or the Swedish system where, uh, children don't have homework and at the very highest levels in, in high school, they have homework of about, of about 10 to 20 minutes a day. Yeah. And I compare that to a place in Ghana where, with schools in Ghana, where children can have upwards of three to four hours of homework every day. And I thought, if I were to announce this at a PTA, that I was going to abolish homework, I think I would be strung and quartered immediately. <laughs> yeah. Mm, yeah. So it, it's so contextual, but um, I think that the simplest definition I can give for quality, mm -hmm. uh, quality education is a, a quality education must prepare one to be a productive citizen, right? And for me, the key words here being productive mm -hmm. in that the show in what one produces. If I say that I have educated you and it has been a quality education, what's there to prove it? It has to be shown in what you produce. And then the next one is citizen that one must be accountable to the society and contribute to its growth and sustainability. So if right. an educational system can do that, very simply put, that it must prepare one to be a productive citizen, then I think they can say that they've got a quality education. Um, countries, they have their own standards. Uh, in Ghana, there's an inspectorate. Um, their job is to ensure that schools are doing well against standards that the, the country has set for itself. Um, against which that particular jurisdiction itself. Um, to, my, to my knowledge though, the, the most popular standard that we use in Ghana, although we do have an inspectorate and the, the stuff that, uh, but most people in Ghana measure quality education by exams. Who's doing right. well in exams? How many people passed? What, what was uh, the percentage rate compared to you know, previous years and, and so on? Um, but globally, there are many benchmarking bodies that are optional to join. So within Africa, uh, my school is a member of the Association of International Schools of Africa. And right. they've got some benchmarking, uh, benchmarking standards um, that we rate ourselves on. They don't come and, and measure us. Um, we do our own internal measurements against what they have. And then internationally in Europe, um, the one that we are part of is COIS, uh, C-O-I-S. The Council of International um, Council of International Schools, and that's based in Europe. And then in the Americas, we have um, and these these organizations um, have uh, a cycle of accreditation, and schools that opt to go with them, you pay a fee. Um, they walk you through a whole process. You have all the paperwork about what constitutes a quality education. So they've come up with their standards. And um, this tends to be sort of across the board um, globally. And so we know that if we can 
um, match up against those standards, and we're doing pretty, pretty well. So for me, uh, NGAN International School, uh, benchmarking ourselves against uh, COIS in Europe, NEASC in, in uh, North America, um, our examination results that are through Cambridge, right? Um, all mm -hmm. of these come in, uh, get into our data pool, and that data pool is then mined, and we look at it and we're like, wow, how well are we doing? And uh, to give you an example, year six examinations, uh, Ghana International School has consistently for the last two years, we just started taking it two years ago, um, just to benchmark our, our uh, educational system, uh, we've consistently scored above the world average. Okay. And so for that, we're like, yeah, that must be, that must be a good thing. We're doing something right, you know? And then we look at um, the results as well internally and we say, okay, you know what, last year we didn't do as well um, as the year before. What could possibly be the reason? What did we change? Uh, was it the teachers we had in that year group? What kind of training did we give to them? And then we, we have our own benchmarks in the school as well. So to answer that question, there are benchmarks that uh, one could use. I'm not sure that the government um, benchmarks national standards. We've got our own standards in the country, but I've never seen a study um, that has been published um, that shows how well we have done against the rest of the world that has come from the government. Usually it's from outside, like PISA, mm -hmm. PISA, measuring science and math, and you find Ghana and a lot of African countries way down on the bottom. And our PISA is the one releasing this, all right? You find Finland and Sweden way up on top there. England is somewhere around like 18 or 20, and mm -hmm. America's hovering around 20-something, and they get all worked up about it. And then there's this whole you know, discussion, why are they doing better than us? Japan doing really, really well. South Korea doing yeah. well. Um, but I've never um, heard that you know, Ghana was, let's say, 150 out of 155 countries. So, this is what we're gonna do about it. And yet every year, um, these studies come out. But I haven't heard of, of what we are doing about it. So either we've given up trying to compete um, and, and we've decided we're gonna do our own thing because maybe they're measuring something else that we don't value as much or we don't quite know where to start from. Okay, that's really interesting. That's really interesting, Mary. Um, uh... And um, again, I guess it goes back to when you say about quality, it's about producing a sort of economically active, you know, member of, of society, isn't it? I mean, that's ultimately where you judge the quality of an education system. It's in, it's in the proof of, of, the, of the students. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. They must not only be able to work to, to produce something, but they must be good people. Yeah. They must be on the right side of the road. They must stop when there's a red light. Yeah. You know, yeah. sim sim simple yeah. things like that. But, you know, yeah. on a daily basis, I ask myself, mm. where have these people been educated? And, you know, it comes back to, for me, the fact that there's a difference between schooling and education because these people have been schooled. Mm. All right? They've been schooled. But education transforms you. You know, so if you are not a productive member of society, I'm afraid you haven't been educated. Yeah. You've just been schooled. Very right? interesting. That's a very good distinction, actually. It's it's well worth uh, bearing in mind, you know, um, that someone who's, uh, you know, socially responsible and economically active person is an educated person. And, you know, if someone isn't like that and it just, you know, thinks of themselves, drives on the long, wrong side of the road, you know, uh, you know, do, do, you know, breaks the law. They've been schooled but not educated, broadly speaking. I think that's interesting. Let's go to the fourth question, uh, Mary, that's been sent in. Um, it's uh, then they're, they're all very interesting and quite tough questions as we're finding. Um, education systems set objectives and those objectives are then operationalized in, in the curriculum and teacher's guide. So, you know, you know, you have an education system, it sets objectives, and then that's put into practice through the curriculum and the teacher's guide. What are the educational, uh, what, are, what, what are the educational systems set in Ghana, okay? And are they functioning to international standards? 
<laughs> well, um, this is another one that could take all day. All right. Yeah, yeah. So I'd, I'd like to refer. We have time. Members. We have time. <laughs> <laughs> we've got we've got even more questions coming up, but it, it's yeah. an entire document, so uh, clearly I can't go through all of it. But sure. the objectives can be found at the Ministry of Education website, and get typical, you know. Uh, to pr produce citizens who do A, B, C, D, and, and so on. Yeah. Students must be able to add that, that, that. So that's there. And as the member rightly said, uh, this is then operationalized in the curriculum and teacher guides. Uh, the former happens to be of good quality. I actually like the Ghanaian curriculum, the public school curriculum. Uh, public school in the Ghanaian sense, not the British uh, sense of public school, but government funded, I guess. So I quite like the curriculum. Uh, I would change a few things here and there, just tweaking here and there, but on the whole, I quite like it. I think it's well thought out. It is well written. Mm -hmm. um, as to whether it's functioning to international standards, though, this this takes me back to the uh, the question about competing globally. Um, at the secondary level, when we send our students out for competitions, how well do they fare against students from other countries? Not very well. Even when I watch the national competitions in math and science that we have in Ghana. Um, I wonder why the questions hardly involve those that require higher order thinking skills. Most of the time, there are questions um, at level one, I would say. Where level one is, what is, what is, uh, what is the color of this chair? You would have had to see the chair. Uh, you, you would have had to see the chair sometime before. So it's recall information. But to move over to higher order thinking questions, that would say, this chair was blue last yeah. week. Um, there was a thunderstorm and there was acid rain. How might the color of the chair change and why do you think it would change? So questions that ask how might, how would, these are level four thinking questions. Mm -hmm. But when I watch the national competitions, the questions are hardly those ones. So if we're not focusing on how one might do something differently. Is it any wonder that we keep doing the same things over and over again? Mm. In the workplace, are we developing systems to make us more efficient? If we can't answer yes to any of these with any confidence, then I don't think it's functioning to international standards at all. You know, because right from the get-go, we're not asking children the right questions. We expect them to uh, memorize. Uh, we, we used to have a phrase, and I'm sure members will remember, the chew, poor, pass, and forget. And uh, that, that, that was a sort of mantra. You get the book, you chew it, chew it meaning you memorize it, you pour it, meaning at the exam time, you just say everything that you know, and you pass your exam, and you promptly forget it. And then you move on to the next thing that you have to chew, pour, pass, and forget. There's hardly any application. We don't give enough time in class because, again, we're exam riddled. And I think, you know, one of the questions is going to ask about exams as well, yeah. that that's our Amazing. end goal, you know, that's our end goal. And when that's the case and you have a syllabus to complete, the teacher doesn't have time to say, okay, boys and girls, get in groups of three or four. We've got a football pitch outside that's, I don't know, how long a football pitch is, I have no idea. But let me just say 100 by 30, for example, 100 by 30, you know, and we want to... Um, we want to grow some grass and it grows at the rate of this per day or per minute. How long do you think it will take to grow it if I have these three different varieties of grass, um, research where they come from, blah, you know? It's project-like. Mm. Kids will sit in groups, they will brainstorm, they will research, they'll come back and they'll argue it out and then present a cogent argument you know, for that until we get to that point where we have time or we create time to be able to do that, all we're gonna have is a teacher going to class and say, turn to page 35. Sodium plus chlorine gives you sodium chlorine. All right, sodium acid, when you react them, will give you a salt and probably the extent of thinking is just to try to figure out which salt will it produce, you know? Right. And so you figure out which salt it produces, you've got your answer right. What do you do with that information anyway? You know, how many of us go into the kitchen and mix sodium hydroxide and hydro hydrochloric acid? At what point in your life is this going to be important? But if it can be tied to the fact that acid in your stomach, right, can get diluted, 
but you don't want the acid to be diluted to too much to a certain point where you can't digest your food anymore because food has to be digested at a certain pH. And so if you eat certain foods, you increase pH, your digestion is compromised, fats get deposited, whatever. Do you see what I mean? It has some yes. real meaning to our lives. Until we can do that, it's not going to be able to get us to, to compete at all. Okay. Uh, that's very interesting, Mary. And uh, in fact, you, you you touched on this point a bit earlier um, about exams. You mentioned that, you know, you use the word we're sort of riddled with sort of exams. You can't get away from it. I mean, you know, wherever you go in the world, you know, you've got to have some benchmark for saying this student is, is, is you know, good and there's an aptitude than that student. But exams, as we all know, is quite, you know, different. Testing is different from an education and, and, and a well-rounded education and developing. We all develop at different rates. You know, you, some kids are very academically proactive at 12. Others, nothing happens for them until they meet the right teacher at 17 or 18, right? So, so, so let's, uh, the, 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 the fifth question is, is pretty key here. And um, <coughs> I'm speaking as a as a parent of uh, you know three kids who've just one has done just done eleven plus another who's about to do GCSEs and a third who's doing uh, A levels right in the UK. Oh, wow. But you know, uh, the sort whole of, uh, you know go, at the same go, time, go, yeah. all, virtually at the same time. So here's the question: For many <laughs> people, you know, both casual and expert observers, right? I mean, governments, political authorities, parents, communities, you know, everybody, you know, education quality is defined by national examinations you know wherever you are right yeah. so what's your opinion you know is 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 there no other way around than these exams and 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 is and what's the bad side of exams because for a lot of kids you know you might get five d's at a certain stage well you might go on to be really good later on does and it sort of cuts you off at that point and it makes you feel you're no good that's right that's right well this is a I, do, I, I keep saying this is a toughie. Education on the whole is a toughie. And yeah. it's just so flawed. I mean, it's a necessary evil. Let me start off with that, that exams are a necessary evil. They're stressful for students. I bet they're stressful for you as a parent with three yeah. children going through sure. that. I've got my last one um, doing his GCE. I, I, we have IGCSEs, the international GCSEs. Yes, we have those here too, yeah. Okay. So I have my last one going through that. And um, he only he, um, uh, he only appears from his cave to, uh, and to show me he's alive. Uh, he almost looks like a kid because his exams are weak. Um, yeah. Very stressful. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And um, but then it's and a right. Parent, as a parent, there must be something in you thinking, you know, this this isn't right, you know. <laughs> Oh, I do. I do all the time. But you see, when I talk to parents, <laughs> uh, because we went through it and we feel like we survived, you know, you, you want your kids to be tough, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. and you're like, you know what? I survived. It wasn't the end of the world. So they can yeah. do the same. Yeah. Uh, but we've got to be careful um, because we're, we're quite different from our children. You yeah. know, um, we were, we were hardier um, yeah. probably because the system made us that way yeah. uh, we have certain supports the kids don't have today they have exposures that we didn't have um at all and so it's it's very very different and but also um, like they're, they're emerging into a very different world because back then you weren't competing with you know uh, yeah. students from china and india and brazil and all these other emerging you know yeah it's rough it's really yeah. rough and the fear that if you fail it feels like the end of your life, yes. you know? And we all know somebody, I know, I know tons of people in my year group who failed a major exam, couldn't continue on the educational journey. That's tragic. The, the, that you, or you, you failed your A-level and you, you can't be good enough. Um, some who stayed in Ghana found something to do in business, yeah. out of the politics. Those, the interesting thing is that those who left Ghana to go mm -hmm. either to the UK or to the US, they have done really well. Interesting. Question. They failed these exams in Ghana, but they are doing well. They've yeah. gone on colleges and universities, and, and, and it's not because they went and they did some lame course or something. These guys are engineers. Yeah. They're 
as you know, those fields that one would consider you need academic, mm. you know, strength to be able to do that. Um, many children are not good students. I don't think we realize that. Mm. Many of our children um, will be able to verbally um, recount what they have learned. They will be able to share with you what that learning means. As mm. soon as you put them in a room with a couple of other kids and there's an invigilator at the front, there's a huge clock staring at them. And then you say, you have two and a half hours for this exam. You are not allowed to talk to anybody, blah, blah, blah. You give all the instructions. And then you say, start work. Immediately, the heartbeat just goes mm. whoa, right mm -hmm. through the window. And really? the studies are done to show how much um, the heart races in such a situation. Yeah. When that there are all sorts of chemicals flowing through your system. Some of them short circuit memory. They will right. short circuit what you knew. I mean, I can recount several times where I've been in the exam room. I'm like, I know this stuff. I know this stuff. Why have I forgotten it? And I won't forget one joke that um, used to be told when we were in school of um, a student who had studied, you know, in biology. Um, you knew that you were either going to have to talk about the, the frog, Bufo regularis, or mm. Agama, Agama the lizard. Uh, I can't remember the third one. Um, and so, you know, it was like too much to study. And so this student decided, I'm just going to pick one and I'm going to hedge my bets. So he picked Agama, Agama. So he was ready to draw out the entire lizard. Uh, it's digestive system, everything to do with agama, agama. Well, he gets to the exam room and it isn't agama, it's bufo regularis. Mm -hmm. So this kid is sitting there thinking, I am so messed up right now. I can't do this. And, uh, and then thinks of a really clever thing to do. So he said, bufo regularis um, is an amphibian. Uh, the, the, the lizard yeah. uh, can also be considered an amphibian, the lizard is known as Agama Agama, and then he wrote everything he knew about Agama Agama. Mm -hmm. You know, because it, in that moment, he couldn't remember a thing about Bufo, and he really focused a lot on Agama because he didn't have the time to study everything. So our students aren't, we aren't all good students, right? No. And so some other measure has to be found um, for determining whether learning has happened. And I think that's, that's the end goal of an examination. We want to know what you know. Mm. Right? So what do you know? And what ways could you use to demonstrate what you know? Could you draw it out? Could yeah. you talk about it? Could you act it out? I remember one exam that I had for a grade uh, 11 group. I was teaching them biology uh, and chemistry. So for the students doing biology and chemistry, um, we had studied the glycolytic cycle, right? So how glucose is broken down uh, in the body to give ATP energy, right? And right. so study that. And so um, I said, you know what? Instead of just drawing out the cycle for me, instead of filling in um, blanks in a, in a, in a, in a narrative um, form, why don't you tell me a story? All right. And I'll, I'll say this very simply. There's some people um, who are members here who are completely medical. They'll probably get this fully. But for those who aren't. So basically, you get glucose. And once glucose is ingested in the body, it breaks down. All right. So um, glucose, the first step will be glucose 6-phosphate. So you get a phosphate being added onto glucose. Right. After the phosphate is added onto glucose, that glucose then changes to become fructose 6-phosphate. All right. So the phosphate is still attached, but now glucose becomes fructose. Right. So glucose, glucose six phosphate, and mm -hmm. then fructose six phosphate. All right. Yeah. And then it splits into two two compounds that I shortened to, to DAP and GAP. All right. Now this one student wrote his his story, and I still have the essay. I actually asked him if I could keep it. I'm talking. Um, this is from about nineteen. 98. I still have that essay. Wow. He said to me, he said, uh, so glucose entered the ghost town. So he made it look like this was a Western. Okay. So imagine Clint Eastwood, he gets into this ghost town. And of course, what does Clint do first? He goes into um, uh, a pub or a salon yeah. Yeah. and he goes there because he's got to look at, you know, who's there, who he's yeah. going to fight, you know? 
So he has the Clint character being mm -hmm. glucose. Right. And when he gets into the salon, um, he picks up a gun. So the gun was the phosphate that he was adding to himself. So right. glucose, glucose 6-phosphate. But he's holding the gun in his left hand. And so when he enters the salon, he sees that there's some mean looking guys there. And he's like, I'm better with my right hand. So he shifts that gun to his right hand, right? That's glucose 6-phosphate turning into fructose 6-phosphate. Amazing. So same guy, but the gun yeah. is on a different arm, right? Amazing. And then from there, the, these two guys that appeared, not knowing they were his friends, so he throws guns at them. So this is the glucose 6-phosphate turning into fructose 6-phosphate, now splitting into DAP and GAP, making two instead of the one. And I read through that essay. This is a child who's got literary strength, right? Absolutely, and imagination. Exactly, but this is a child who also understands the biochemistry of it, yeah, right? Yeah. So they have understood it and they know what the steps are and now they're taking that learning into another sphere. In a right? way, that other kids could understand it. I mean, if I if my chemistry exactly. books or biology books were written like that, I would have been a much better exactly. student. Exactly, it's much more fun. And, yeah. you know, when it came to exam time, the kids will say, um, Doc, should we, should we, um, give you the answer the way it's in the textbook or the way that it's more fun. I say, give me the answer the way you understand it. Yeah. All right. Yeah. And that way I can tell they actually get it, yeah. you know. So we have to, to develop other measures of determining that learning has happened. And we have to give them the same value that we give to examinations. Yeah. You know, examinations to us are the, you know, end all and be all. But yeah. we've got to say, you know, some people would be better at it if they had to act it out. I mean, you have three kids. I'm sure there's one who loves acting out everything. I have one of those. You know, if he had to sing for his dinner, he would have meals 24-7. Yeah. You know, kids have got different strengths that I feel we're not utilizing in trying to measure their learning. So at the end of the day, we say they haven't learned anything. They failed. They got a D, mm. right? Until they go into a different school system, meet a teacher who is funky, who knows that learning can be expressed in different ways, and suddenly that child goes from a D to an A, mm. and we wonder why. Yeah. Well, not only is learning more fun, but we are actually testing their learning in a way that they can express themselves. Good. Right? This is a very interesting, that's really interesting. A, a good question that's just come in, actually, not part of... Uh, um uh what we've had but it's it's very interesting from from robert wood you know what would you say you know we're, we're talking about you know uh having an educational system that functions to sort of international standards right you know the holy yeah. grail of you know being at school in kenya ghana mozambique wherever and we have the same you know uh international standards as kids in the uk or europe or whatever else but doesn't this just enhance the brain drain that we're complaining about? I mean, um, why don't we? Why aren't we setting standards of our own to utilize resources within our within the environment we live in to benefit the communi communities we live in and to tackle the problems that we have? Because if you're following the you know uh, the the exam board from you know America or Finland, they're you know made to answer the problems that you know are in Finland and Sweden, whatever else, not the ones that are in Ghana or Somaliland or whatever else. So, mm -hmm. and doesn't it just increase the brain drain? Some people think, okay, I've got these exams. They're from Cambridge University, Oxford University, Harvard. I'll go to the West. I, but I don't think that, you know, theoretically that could happen. Um, but I don't think that that's what would happen by just benchmarking yourself against others. I don't think that that's what would happen. Um, mm. what, what that means, um, rather, I think, is that you open yourself up to collaborating with people from around the world. Um, we mm. can't even begin to presume that we can solve our problems by ourselves. Um, but first of all, our educational system, and like I said, the curriculum uh, is well designed, I think. And you will find that the questions that are in the curriculum, the Ghanaian curriculum, um, that teachers are supposed to, to ask kids um, to, to answer and project work and so on, they are all designed to answer Ghanaian problems or African problems. They're questions okay. about sanitation. 
all right, questions about overcrowding in the city. So the, the, the curriculum is designed to help solve the problems yeah. here. Now, benchmarking doesn't mean that you're taking everything from there and, 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 and lifting a lock, stock and barrel and bringing it over here and saying, you must do this. Let me give you an example. Ghana International School is going to go through a 10 year accreditation next week. One of the areas um, that we will be looking at is, um, is uh, curriculum, obviously. You know, how are we teaching? you know and so the visitors who are going to come and evaluate us are going to enter our classrooms now when you get into history and geography classrooms we have a lot of local content all right so this person coming from new england or this person coming from belgium isn't coming to rate us on the content that we are teaching our kids but rather on the delivery all right so my students will go to willie falls They'll go there to go and take some water samples, test it for alkalinity and acidity, and determine whether the flora and the fauna in the area would be supported by that level of acidity in the water, right? Mm -hmm. But it's right here. I'm not going to take water samples from the Thames, mm -hmm. and I'm not going to be measuring what the Thames means to me. Do you see sure. what I mean? So the, I the benchmarking is to say, are you allowing teachers or are you training teachers? Are you providing an environment that attend to what the children are studying and how is it delivered. This is what the international benchmarking does, right? So it isn't brain draining us. I think rather what it does is put us on a level where we can collaborate with them. Another trend that I've started, a trend that I have um, started seeing is a lot of Ghana international school students are coming back home to Ghana mm -hmm. after training outside. They go and get their degrees and several of them come back. Now, this is very different from our time. You know, those of us mm. who graduated in the 80s, uh, 70s, 80s, very early 90s, there was absolutely no thought of coming back home. What yeah. for? Yeah. What are you going to do? You know, yeah. and so we stayed out. We worked out there. The so-called brain drain actually happened, right? But now, yeah. more and more, I'm getting alumni coming back. They come and meet me when we have alumni fora, and they come in. These are 20 something year olds, 30 something year olds. They finish their undergraduate, some have done their masters, a couple have done their PhDs. They come back to Ghana to set up businesses. Then we've got Ashesi University, and I think um, somebody asked a question about that uh, a bit later on um, about Ashesi University training students with an international mindset that is ready to focus on African problems, you know? And so you get in there and you listen to the students. It's all about what we can do for the continent. And uh, one time I was invited to speak in their business ethics class. And before I spoke, um, the professor said, um, if you can permit us for just about 15 minutes um, to have three students go up and they have this assignment that they do uh, before class. Every student has to do this during the term. Um, they have five minutes, was it one minute or five? One minute actually, not five minutes, but one minute to project an image um, that to them defines leadership. One minute, just project the image and talk about it. So the first student who projected an image was of um, Ronaldo about to take, um, what is it? Is it a free, free kick? A penalty, free yeah, free kick or penalty, yeah. Yeah, to take a penalty, all right? So the, the angle from which the picture is taken, you're, you're, you're behind, you can see the back of Ronaldo's head, mm -hmm. all right? And um, the defenders are there, but they are blurred but the goal is an absolute focus. Mm -hmm. You can see the goal so sharply, but the defenders are in focus. You can't see Ronaldo's face, so you can't see that determined look. But the student said to me, leadership, African leadership should be about seeing the goal, keeping the goal in complete focus while the obstacles are there. The obstacles will always be there, but let yeah. them be blurred. Let them be blurred. Second student was even more profound, I thought. She projected an image of uh, the solar system. And she said, to me, leadership is like the sun. The sun shines all day. It does what it's supposed to do. It provides energy for plants to grow and da, 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 da. And at night, what does the sun do? The sun goes down and the moon comes up. The moon mm -hmm. doesn't have its own light. We're able to see the moon because of the light that the sun reflects on the moon. And so to her, leadership in Africa should be about 
the sun going down, whoever's in leadership, when it's your time to go, you go. But you do all you can to shine your light on the next generation so they can do what they're meant to do in the nighttime. And I remember sitting there thinking, oh, my word, so That's profound, amazing. you know, that when it got to my turn, I was like, I have no idea what to say because I'm now filled with hope that we're actually raising leaders who are going to be thinking very ethically, who are going to be thinking about what this means to the rest of the continent as opposed to just getting schooled, right? So I, I wouldn't worry about the brain drain. I think that if the economy continues the way it's going, expanding little by little, but if educational opportunities are presented to these students so that they're not afraid, and that's another thing that when you benchmark internationally, your children know they're just as good as anyone in North America or Europe. So whatever they want to do, they can also apply to the Ford Foundation. They can apply to the MasterCard Foundation. Why not? Because they've got all the tools to do that. But instead of setting up whatever organization they were planning to in Brussels, in London, in Paris, in New York, in Toronto, they're going to set it up in Ghana. They're going to set it up in Accra and hire people in Accra to work. Great. All right, next question, uh, Mary, that's been uh, sent in. Um, uh, again, it's what you talk about, the difference between schooling and being educated. Does the current mm. education system help develop world-savvy young people? Mm. You know, in other words, creative, critical thinkers with leadership skills, adept at problem solving, you know, comfortable with the sort of ambiguity and, you know, uh, change? You know, d d does it develop kids like that at the moment? Uh, and, 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 you know, how do we measure such dispositions? Yeah. Because those I, are really important. You know, when you look at sort of, uh, you know, people internationally, it's those able to think on their feet, to be able to make yeah. an argument, to deal with intangibles, problem solve, so forth. Um, I think the current system is developing some savvy, some world savvy people, but not in the way uh, that you've described. They're okay. very world savvy you know, when it comes to uh, technology use and, and all of that. They're doing all the stuff that young people uh, outside the continent are doing. Um, but the, the dispositions that you highlighted, um, they tend to be measured through collaborative exercises that require students to work on projects to produce something. Mm -hmm. And because we're not doing much of that, we're not able to even develop them, let alone measure them, right? Um, we're so focused on exam preparation. Yeah. Um, so these collaborative group projects, because they, they take time, we just don't do them. And um, our exams don't measure these dispositions, you know, and what isn't measured isn't valued. So it's even like the report card. I mean, at GIS, our report cards have gone through quite some change because we realize if you don't put co-curricular activities as being measured on the report card, children won't want to go for co-curriculars and they'll find a way to escape it. If you don't put community service involvement on a report card, mm -hmm. children won't want to do it and they will try to escape it. So what isn't measured isn't valued. Mm -hmm. So until we realize that these are um, uh, our skill sets that young people need to be able to compete globally, and then we determine how to measure them and we sort of work backwards, it's not going to get done. And at the moment, what we seem to be focusing on is the ability to recall, right? right. And that's what the examinations are measuring, unfortunately. Okay, um, yeah. very interesting. Um, very specific question uh, coming in. Um, do you see the average Ghanaian kids' education equipping them to participate in tomorrow's digital world? Not really. Um, they, they're, they're definitely more digitally savvy than their parents are. Um, and That's not very difficult, I think. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, how many of us are at home? I mean, I'm guilty of this. You know, yeah. I'm, I'm, I, I want to watch something on, on the TV, but now TVs are so complicated. So I'm sitting downstairs and I go, Jojo, come down and show me what to do. And he comes down and he's like, gosh, mom, for the umpteenth time, you know, you just take the remote, you do this, you do that. You know, they're just... They're digital natives, you know. Um, the reason why I don't think that we're equipping them well is because um, within the school system, we teach tools responsibly, 
That's the key thing. You know, they've got yeah. the mobile technology in their hands and they know how to do a whole lot of things, but they don't know how to be responsible with mm. it, right? And the people who would teach them that aren't comfortable with the technology, you know? So if you were to say to teachers, you know, why don't we allow uh, mobile phones in class and perhaps we could be teaching with the mobile phones, you could do, um, uh, what is it called? I can't remember the name now. It's just escaped me. But there's this app where, you know, the teacher would be teaching. They'll put a problem on the board. Um, the, the students are supposed to solve the problem. Mm -hmm. And um, the, the, the multiple choice answers are there. And the teacher can immediately tell what percentage of the students have got the answer right. And um, in an advanced way, they can also determine which child because each child has got that tracker in their hand of their, their mobile phone and it is logged in with a particular code so quite right. i can tell that like johnny who's sitting in the middle row third seat from the front right um didn't get that answer right but the whole class doesn't need to know you know we don't yeah. need to but you as a teacher do you have that wrong you know and other kids will laugh at johnny so the next time johnny's not going to want to try again yeah all right yeah. so there are all these technologies that we could be using in class um, to enhance the learning. But yeah. the teachers themselves are not comfortable with it. You have the younger teachers are better, as, as can be expected. The older teachers don't even want to go there. To them, it's scary. Kids are going to be accessing porn and, and that sort of thing. You know, they, they look at the very worst instead of saying, what's the very best that could come out of this? And if we're still scared about kids, go into all sorts of sites that we do not approve on. What can we do to stop that or, or minimize it? It's very difficult to completely stop that, but what can we do to minimize it? So we need to train our teachers better to be able to do that. We need to remove some of the fear, you know, that comes from technology use. And then these adults who are with our children six hours a day, if they can be even as close to them as possible in being comfortable with the technology, then they will be able to teach them how to use it responsibly so that then they can be more digitally savvy. Okay, very interesting. All right, we're gonna move on to a question uh, again uh, that's been sent in. Um, Mary, what do we need to change or add to our education so we can produce people who can when they are qualified, add value to our resources. And uh, the question, the questioner, the sending in this in says, I ask this against a background in Ghana in which we have resources, but have forever exported them in their raw state rather than have them manufactured or purified as value added products in Ghana. Mm -hmm. You would have thought, mm -hmm. I mean, Ghana has, has been producer of, you know, gold and minerals for sort of, you know, decades now that there would be, yeah. You know, or, or or is that wrong? I mean, you know, we have you know Ashanti gold fields. You know, are, you know, are Ghanaians actually part and parcel of that process rather than it just being a UK or international company that's just bringing in, you know, taking the raw material and you know adding value elsewhere? Yeah, um, I I think that at that end point where you know products are, are being created outside, being brought back to us to purchase our own stuff, um, that sort of should I say that that's, that's the extension of something that started very soon. Um, because by that time, we don't even have uh, much of an accountability for our actions and a love for our own continent in order to seek what's best. Um, it's become a very individual thing where um, people who are in positions where they could make money are saying, how much can I make from this? and they're not thinking about the whole. And, and this comes back to my definition of the quality education, you know, that they must be citizens. And if you're a citizen, you don't care just about yourself, you care about the whole, you know. Yeah. But that would have started very, very early on with what yeah. has happened in the classroom. And since the response for a teacher in the classroom, for me, I keep coming back to that teacher. Uh, we need to treat teachers as assets. And I think that will lead us to the next question. I don't know whether you want me to continue because uh, for us to be able to change our educational system to the point where we are actually getting something out of all the stuff that we have 
by just virtue of being in Africa. I mean, for crying out loud, look at how many hours we have the sun shining. Yes, exactly. Right? Why, why do we have lights off? You yeah. know, with the why do we have an electricity time? problem? Yeah. You know, you, you drive outside of a cry, you see all the green, and you're thinking, yeah. for crying out loud, we should be feeding the rest of the world, mm. you know, with all the land and, and, and how terrible it is and, and so on. But it starts with what we are told when we are children. And who's telling us that thing? I know parents play a huge role, but like I said, for about six hours every day, there's an adult, a live adult in the classroom. Until we figure out what to do with that live adult, nothing's going to happen. Hmm. Very, yeah. very, very interesting. I mean, it's just really, given them, um, yeah. you know, the, 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 you know, Africa should be providing power, electricity, you know, energy, um, uh, food, you know, to the rest of the world. But um, yeah. we're getting we'll a lot of hydro, hydro, the potential for hydro energy that we have across the continent. Hmm. Yep. Incredible. Yeah, incredible. To say but nothing it, it, of solar. Yeah. Okay. Um, ninth question. Uh, I think uh, we've got on to again. Uh, very uh, straight, bold question. Um, what is in place to ensure competent twenty-first century teachers? I mean, if 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 teachers are the bedrock upon which our education mm -hmm. systems are built, and they're the role models, you know that that kids are spending most of their day with in a classroom mm -hmm. you know what do we have in place in ghana um uh, and elsewhere to ensure that we have competent 21st yeah. century teachers so this is what's in place not what i think should be in place right mm. <laughs> this this yeah. is what's in place. okay so um the, the history of teacher education across the continent um it's a really long one obviously we'll take a couple of sessions because of um, wars and epidemics and, and so on. Every country has its story. I'm sure Somaliland yeah. has its own. Yes, uh, yeah. So the history of teacher education can't be taken as a continent-wide phenomenon. Yeah. Um, but, but basically, in all, all our countries, we have teacher training institutions that purport to train our teachers to teach in the 21st century. The interesting thing is that I don't know how many people know what that means, what right. 21st century actually means. Um, I, I think that, well, sometimes when I talk to some teachers in publicly funded schools, um, what they think this means is that they must be able to use computers, they must not beat children, and they must ask children questions. Mm -hmm. These are the things that keep popping up for me. Don't beat kids anymore because apparently beating is bad. Um, learn to use the computer because everybody is on the computer. And then the third thing is that we have to ask them questions. Well, what questions must we be asking them? Um, computers have been purchased for a number of schools. Uh, training is given to teachers so that they can teach with the tools. Whether there's follow-up to see whether um, this actually continues is another story. Because you could gather all the teachers together in, uh, in a hall, in a, in, a, in a computer lab, excuse me, and, and teach them how to use Microsoft Word or teach them how to do a PowerPoint. Uh, how to present their lessons um, using PowerPoint and all that. And they get excited in the room. You know, I, I've been in sessions where public school teachers are thinking, this is amazing. This would be so great. My kids would be engaged and so on. And then you follow up a, a couple of weeks down the line. They're not doing any of that. Uh, part of it is the support isn't there. Um, they go back to their school. Mm -hmm. There's no light, there's no electricity. Um, they may not have laptops. Even if they do have laptops, setting them up may be a problem, uh, but the follow-up isn't there. So they do have workshops that are being held to support them in this way. Um, and, and workshops are also held for teachers on child development, as well as classroom strategies. How do you teach, or how different is it to teach a 12-year-old from a six-year-old? All right. How do you design your lessons so that you can keep that 13 year old boy engaged? Mm -hmm. And how often must you give a break to that eight year old child as opposed to that 16 year old child? So a lot of these workshops are being done so that people understand that a six year old cannot sit in the same spot for two hours and be expected to absorb anything at all. 
So that yeah. is my place, all right? And, and computers have been purchased and all of that. Um, all of them are great, but there's a certain mindset change that needs to happen. And I think Akosia uh, Ashabo had um, a face the form session where she talked about mindsets uh, because yeah. the, the strategies for using technology, caring for children, using guiding questions to generate transformative thinking won't take root until teachers actually believe that they're important. Mm -hmm. One of the things that I haven't heard of, uh, and I interview teachers all the time uh, when they're looking for jobs, is that I don't know if anyone is challenging them to ask them that what is your philosophy of education? What's your philosophy of teaching? What do you believe? Not what you think I want you to believe, but what do you mm -hmm. really believe? And why do you believe what you believe? There's a question that I love asking prospective teachers and teachers who are applying for promotion. Right. The question goes like this, who is most responsible for learning in the classroom? Mm -hmm. Who is most responsible for learning? Sometimes I don't even add classroom, I just say, who is most responsible? Is it the student? Is it the teacher? Or is it the parent? Invariably, the high school teachers will say the student is the most responsible for learning, the one most responsible for learning. Yeah. Um, an infant school teacher is likely to say um, the teacher is the one most responsible for learning. But you know, within that question is such a loaded statement of the responsibility of a teacher. And if you say you're a teacher, who you're placing the responsibility on? Because if as a teacher, you believe that the responsibility lies entirely with the child, then if that child fails, you don't really care. You're yeah. not going to review your practice and, and to say, you know, maybe I didn't teach this thing well. Maybe I could have done it this way or whatever. Yeah. Because your mindset is that it's the child's responsibility. It's the parent's responsibility. It's not mine. I've done my bit. I go in, I talk for an hour, I leave, the child's supposed to have learned, you know? So something requiring those who want to go into teaching to ask themselves that critical question. And I don't think it's too important if at the beginning, mm -hmm. they don't. all children are inherently different. And so they have to be taught differently, right? They may yeah. not believe this, but for me, it's more crucial that by the time they are graduating from a teacher education program, if they have not been transformed into thinking this way, they should not be allowed in any classroom. That's a that's a pretty that's a pretty uh, strong uh, strong way to sort of. Oh, that, yeah, that that's what I that's why I would that's what I would say because otherwise you have a toxic environment. That that teacher is not going to be spending. A couple of hours every night looking over their lesson plan and saying have i hit some of the visual uh, visual learners have i hit some of the spatial learners have i hit some of those um, um, um kinesthetic learners and you can't hit everybody admittedly sure. but yeah. throughout the course of the term your lessons must be engaging enough to allow every child to check in yeah check into the classroom instead of sitting there and waiting for it to be over I always tell my teachers that if the bell goes, you're not packing your bags, you're doing a phenomenal job. <laughs> but just before the bell goes, they're packing their books. Their, their books are in their bags already. In fact, some rude kid will stand up to let you know, you know, your time is up. Yeah, absolutely. You're not doing a good absolutely. job at all. No. We've got to get, we've got to get ninja about this <laughs> this is too important to leave to those people who just care a little bit these are yeah. our kids yeah, you can't yeah. afford to care just a little bit you need to care the whole 100 yards yeah. if your child if a child in your class does not do well in an exam it should mm. keep you awake at night you Absolutely. should not go to sleep until you think of a way that you're gonna get you're gonna come up with a way to get that child to learn and if you're not ready to do that, you shouldn't be graduating out of teacher's college. Let me ask you one thing, Mary. It's, um, you know, uh, we all try to do the best we can for our children to the maximum. I mean, you know, of all the things that, you know, we as parents plow into, 
you know, uh, out, you know, whatever extra money we have, it's uh, it's in trying to get our kids, you know, not only just, you know, uh, fed and uh, clothed, but it's education. Education is, you know, one of the things that most parents will try and do as much as they can. It's led to an explosion, obviously, of private schools uh, across mm -hmm. uh, Africa. You know, parents are demanding more. Uh, parents are having to do more just to keep up. Um, uh, and it's true here. It's true in the US. It's true in Europe. You know, people are paying phenomenal amounts, you know, uh, yeah. you know, uh, to do so. What is your view um, about this split between the state system and, and private schools? Because it seems to me, you know, you go to somewhere like Somalia and people are, you know, some universities are not great, to be honest with you. And yet people are paying $4,000, $5,000, $10,000, you know, uh, to, to go to a, to, to a degree that is not that great, to be honest with you, you know. But that's different. You know, people can't get the visa to go to Europe or wherever else. Some try right. to go elsewhere. You come to Uganda. To, so the point I'm saying is, you know, are we seeing a big gulf? You know that you've got great private schools. If you can afford it, you know to send to you know international schools wherever, then you're getting a world class education. But the state schools are being left behind. Is there is there a two tier system in Ghana and in the continent? Yeah, there is, and it's not just in Ghana. It's all over. It's all over the world, and I don't think you can you can run away from it. Um, I think that um, uh, private school private schooling um, has to be allowed. Uh, but you have to let, um, what's the, the, the phrase that's used, like uh, for water to find its level, all mm -hmm. right? Because in a place like Canada, all mm -hmm. right, and I'm sure uh, places in, in, um, in Northern Europe, the public schools are where parents want their kids to go to. Yeah. Do you see what I mean? Why is that? Because the teachers are great. The teachers are paid well. The products of these um, uh, government-funded schools are just as great as the products from the public, um, from the private schools, where and, and in the private schools, you're paying way more or more money for it. Um, until we get to that point, uh, we're going to have the kind of that the, the the two tiered, seemingly unfair system here. And this is why, um, for our environment, where um, the gap is so huge, because we know clearly the the government funded schools um, have got. A, a huge gap or a huge gulf to, to jump yeah. over. Uh, it, it, I think that that's where there's a certain responsibility for those of us who run um, the private schools to be able to partner with the government schools. That's a huge thing for me. Um, yeah. With the strategic plan that we, we started, um, we embarked on just two years ago, uh, the, the five goals that we had, um, the fourth goal is one of my favorites because I mean, goal number one is to be excellent, you know, in academics, which is every school would want that. Uh, the second one is about hiring a multicultural staff so that our children will be exposed and so on. The third one is sound financial management. Um, the last goal is uh, to have facilities that are functional and that supports our purpose. But goal number four is to make impact in our community through service. And for me, this is so critical because what's the point of having all of this and not sharing it, you right. know? And my dad always used to say, to whom much is given, much is expected. And if we have been fortunate enough to be able to school our children in, in, in private institutions where they get a leg up, right? If we don't do something about everybody else who's around us or attempt to do something about everyone around us, one day, as one of my friends said, um, the poor will be so hungry that they will eat the rich. Hmm. Yeah? Mm -hmm. And this is what will happen if we don't take responsibility for, for those um, around us. So the two-tiered system, trust me, it will always be there until we find a way to fix the public school system and make them just as competitive. Okay. Um, here's another question I've uh, been sent in, Mary. In sub-Saharan Africa, only about one quarter uh, of primary T pre sorry, let me do that again. In mm. sub-Saharan Africa, only about one quarter of pre-primary teachers are trained. Okay, upper mm. secondary school teachers have a slightly better ratio. About fifty percent have training. What can we do to train our teachers better and make teaching attractive 
as a as a career as well this has occupied my mind mm. for the last 20 or so years. I better have. Knowing, yeah knowing full well that the teacher is the key the key ingredient in all of this um and um and that's why in one of the previous questions i i, I said um treat teachers as assets mm. and if assets what do you do with assets how do you create assets how do you manage them uh, how do you maintain them and so on so i i would like to adopt an engineering maintenance method. yeah and uh if there's if there's anybody on the forum who's an engineer um forgive me i'm not an engineer but i live with an engineer and mm -hmm. he's an expert on on maintenance of systems and so i keep hearing about how m machines need to be designed well and maintained well for them to be able to go through their life cycle um, so that they can give us what we need. Um, so I took this engineering maintenance metaphor and I applied it to teaching. So you've got three stages here. Uh, that asset has to be designed well, it has to be manufactured well, and it has to be maintained well. Where does the design take place? Right? The design of a teacher takes place in a teacher training institution. And by the time the teacher comes out of that institution, they should be certified to last. When you go and buy a car, um, you want to know, uh, has it passed this crash test? Has yeah. it done this? Has it done that? How long am I likely to have this car go for? All right. And then when you get the car, what do you do? They know how many miles you need to drive it before you have to change oil, before you have to do this and that. And all because you want it to last long enough, right? Yes. So you design well first. So just like on the design floor, if the prototype doesn't quite work, you chuck it, you get back to the drawing board, you do it again. So this requires us to be continuously testing that prototype of teacher. Whatever we call teacher, are we testing that prototype? Are we evaluating it? Are we asking, is this teacher doing what we need it to do? And if not, we go back to the design floor and we redesign it. So teacher education programs are the design hub. That's where the design sh uh, should take place. Something that is designed badly, by the time you get it home, if you're able to get it home, it's not working as well. You know, you may have bought a kettle um, that's supposed to sing um, when, when um, the water boils. You bring it home, you put the water in, plug it in, and it just keeps boiling and boiling. You're waiting for that song, it never happens. Exactly. Something's wrong with it, it hasn't been designed well. If you're in, in a first world country, likelihood is that you have a warranty, you take it back and you tell them it's not working. And what did they do? They give you another one, all right? And over a certain period of time, the company is going to realize people keep returning this product, all right? Yeah something's not quite working and so they go back to the design floor they figure it out and they're like guys we're really sorry about this we didn't design this properly if you bought that kettle come back here's your 29.99 or 59.99 whatever you spent for it i wish we could send teachers back when mm. they're not working okay you you tell me as a teacher ed institution you have designed this teacher well teacher comes to my school within two years i'm like this is not a teacher i send you right back to where you were designed to go and get right. okay so it's been designed then you get manufactured and for me this process takes place about 30 percent in teachers college and about 70 percent in the classroom um now all the research shows that um uh, the practicum training component, right, of a teacher's uh, overall training is the single most important factor in determining whether the person is cut out for the classroom and whether they can hack it. 30, 70, all right? But we do less and less of that training, and then not just even less and less of it, but we place them with teachers who are teaching badly yeah you know and so there's a list that is created and teacher a you're going to school a teacher b you're going to school b i've supervised um teachers in some schools where you get there and um the principal doesn't even know which class that trainee teacher is in that means that they were not even involved in consultation with the teachers college in saying you know what I've got Mr. A, who's a phenomenal chemistry teacher, and this trainee teacher wants to teach chemistry. I should put them with, with um, Mr. Yeah. A, you know? 
We just farm them out to whatever school says that they are available. And imagine that you're there for six weeks, presumably being trained, you know, by someone who just sits there and is on his mobile phone all day, right? And kids have been told, turn to page 30, read up to page 35, <coughs> excuse me, and answer the questions at the back of the book. Teachers on his phone doing God knows what. There's a trainee teacher sitting there. By the time that trainee teacher is done, what are they gonna do themselves in the classroom? They haven't seen a teacher who knows how to divide a one hour class into four segments, who knows just the right time to take a break for kids, who knows when to put them in groups, who knows when to get, uh, get them to stand up and stretch a little bit, who knows that maybe when he's teaching them about area, it would be a great idea to say, guys, let's go out on the, the football field and go and check out what area actually means. Mm. That teacher doesn't know. So some teacher ed programs will say, yes, we have a practicum period. But my question for them would be, who are you placing them with? Because if you're supposed to be being manufactured, they must be manufactured well. And the best learning happens when you're looking at somebody who So that's the second stage. The third stage then is maintenance. So let's assume that this teacher has been designed well. They've yeah. also been manufactured well. Now we put them in the classroom. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, a lot of school systems, and especially in Africa, we leave them alone. And we think to ourselves, they're going to survive. They'll be fine. But in some areas where you have a class of 60 kids, right? Yeah. Reggae, you have three kids at home, all right? Your kids are a little bit older. Imagine having 60 10-year-olds in class. And you are trying to keep them quiet. You're trying to teach them something. You're trying to get them to ask and answer questions. You know, most teachers quit teaching in the first five years of their career. Why? Because it's nuts. You can't, sometimes you can hardly handle the, and you have two, three, four maybe, you know, and your last resort is to say, go to your room. Just so that you don't see them. Well, a teacher can't say, go to your room, you know, to kids, you mm. know, and all they keep doing is yelling and screaming at them um, or just stepping out of the classroom because it's so stressful. We need to support our teachers better through professional development. So in the same way that you will get your well-designed Mercedes-Benz, bring it home. You have that mark of quality that tells you that this is a good car because you know Mercedes does good cars, yes. right? So in the same way, you would go to Teachers College at Columbia University, and you know that going there means that you're going to be a great teacher because they've got all the tools and resources for you, all right? Come practicum time, they place you in, you know, Manhattan School Number 371. You are placed with, with Mr. Rage, who has taught for 25 years. You know, his kids have graduated summa cum laude, and he is known as the best teacher and his specialty is math. Maybe your specialty is in math, but Mr. Ragger's teaching style inspires you to want to do more to get kids to understand math because you never understood math that well. You are then being manufactured well. And then when you finish, you get a job in downtown Buffalo in upstate New York, okay? I'm using outside because sometimes um, if you look at, how it works over there, you can translate it to how it could possibly work here. Right. So here, the analogy would be that I send you to Kotobabi number two, all right? Or La Wireless cluster of schools for the Ghanaians on the forum, they'll know what I'm yeah. talking about, all right? So you get to La Wireless cluster of schools and now you're teaching and nobody's giving you any resources. The head teacher might come and pass by once in a while um, very few times do they ask to see your lesson plans. And even when they do, there's just a flicking right through, but not really to see what the content is and how you're encouraging the kids or engaging them or whatever. Mm. Within five years, if you stay in the teaching profession, you would have switched off. You're only there just to get a paycheck and you will start running your own business. So in the same way that you'll bring your Mercedes home and you are checking the oil and so on every couple of miles and, and so on, um, and you want that Mercedes to last, 
right? The same way, if we want our teachers to last, we need to maintain them. Mm -hmm. We provide different kinds of, of professional development. And it doesn't have to be the same thing all around, you know? I might need professional development that helps me manage a class because mm -hmm. maybe I've got a very difficult class this year. You know, every class is different. So this year, I've got a very difficult class. I need to know about classroom control. Mm -hmm. But maybe next year, it won't be about classroom control. Next year, it will be about how I tie curriculum in with technology. And so for that, I need professional development that helps me to identify resources that I can use in class that are technology focused. Um, and so like at GIS, that's what we're going to be starting in September is arranging the, the different kinds of professional development that teachers could be exposed to into categories and requiring right. them to fulfill a certain number of points, okay? So we'll say that every teacher needs 50 points, okay? You can get 10 points by attending this conference. You can get five points by this, 20 points by mentoring another teacher and, and keeping records of it and so on. So the aim is that by the end of each year, every teacher has done a minimum of 50 points um, and you award them certificates based on how many they do so that that way there's some, there's some pleasure in doing more. Yeah. Um, I, was, I was really pleased um, just last month when I visited South Africa to find, I didn't know this, but the South African government actually has that in place where teachers have all these uh, professional development resources that they can take advantage of and they get points for it. And so they log on each time they attend a conference, they will log on through uh, a teacher portal and they will write up a, a short report of what they learned, how it is relevant to what they do in class, and what they can do with the information that they have, uh, they have gathered at that conference. And then it just keeps a tally of what they have done. And that way, they keep going. And sometimes it's not learning in the sense of sitting behind a computer or attending a conference or reading a book or something, sometimes it's just having an administrator sit with you and say, how are you doing? How are you doing? Oh. How are you coping? And for you to be able to say, you know what, I'm really struggling. And for that administrator or supervisor to say, hey, you know, I remember when I was in my second year of teaching, I also had a challenging class. This is what I did. That's what, just having someone listen to you and yeah. feeling like you're not living on an island right and 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 feeling like there's a certain camaraderie there's a certain support system in place um that could also work for some people so time spent with mentors time yeah. spent with supervisors is critical as well because yeah. it's not yeah. easy so after you've done all of this so you've got your design you've got your manufacturer and you've got your maintenance i think you will be all set mm -hmm. to ensure that a teacher's life cycle of maybe about 30 35 years is productive. They'll have dips and turns every so oh, often. Yeah. But with the professional development and with a supervision, really good supervision, they'll be able to keep going, keep going until they themselves realize, you know what, I've done this long enough, trained enough, I've, I've supported enough, I've mentored enough younger teachers, time for me to bow out and maybe do something different or just retire, you yeah. know? Or we'll hand that uh, over. Yeah. The second part about making teaching attractive, I don't know how many will agree with me, but this is what I think. You need to raise the entry grades for Teachers College, all right? Um, why do we leave it for the, the people who didn't get into medical school, law school, mm -hmm. dentistry school, mm -hmm. school? You know, um, secondary science teachers are almost filled, or secondary science departments are almost filled with people who did get into medical school. Mm -hmm. You know, humanities courses are being taught by people who um, wish they were lawyers instead. Yeah. They didn't get into law school the first time, so they thought, let me get into teacher's college and, and, and go and do that. In places where the educational system is really working well and they are highly on these international um, tests, um, a place like Sweden, like Sweden, Finland, um, you can't become a teacher without a master's degree. Uh -huh. Yes. Right? Yeah. Yeah. In Canada, I remember some years back, um, the percent acceptance rate for teachers college in Ontario was much lower than for medical school. Why is yeah. that? Because teaching was becoming attractive. So mm -hmm. you've got to raise 
the entry grades for teachers. Why should the person who failed math be allowed into teachers' college to teach kids math? Mm. Like it, 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 it makes doesn't make sense whatsoever. You know, makes absolutely no sense. I mean, miraculously, mm. teachers' college they're gonna get good at math. Mm. No, How is that? that doesn't work. So raise the entry grades for teachers' college. Mm. Of course, increase salaries, make it a living wage. In many mm. places in Ghana and in Africa, teachers don't make a living wage. You yeah. know. And so you need to increase salaries to that living wage. You supervise rigorously because oftentimes when we talk about increasing salaries, right? Um, some people will say, well, you increase salaries, but they'll be doing nothing. Well, they'll be doing nothing if no one supervises them, mm -hmm. you know? So it has to go hand in hand. Yeah. The people who are supposed to be supervising them, the administrators, you need to pay them well and they need to understand what their role is. Mm. And then you need to remove incompetent individuals regularly. Why do we have <laughs> why do we have teachers who continue to not perform mm. incompetence at the highest levels and they are still teaching? Yeah, you know, no, that's still not good teaching. enough. It's not good enough. We it's don't hire enough. them. This wouldn't yeah. work in the corporate world. If you're no. not working and you're then not you'd producing, be out. Be out. we get rid of you. Yeah. You know, so we need to be able to have a system where people can tell one another or tell their subordinates that, you know, you're not doing a great job at this. Um, this is where you need to improve. This is how I will support you. That's one of the problems that I find here in Ghana. People are afraid to tell their, their subordinates or um, uh, their mentees the truth, you know, so they're not doing... Well, instead of putting them on an improvement track and telling them what they need to do, you just couch it and you give them a satisfactory rating. And yet they continue to perform badly, you yeah. know. And then we need to be able to communicate regularly with the populace about all that's happening in education. Um, we only hear the bad stories, you know. We don't hear about that teacher in the Volta region whose mm. exams for her students arrived so late mm. The village. I can't even remember what the name of the village was. It was dark and there was no light in that village. This young teacher, she's barely in her late 20s, went and bought candles, right? Lit the candles up in the... She didn't even have a classroom. When you see what these children had to endure just to take that exam because it arrived in the village too late, they were sitting on plastic chairs writing on plastic chairs, using the seat of the plastic chair as the table. All right? Why is that not a good news story if one child from that environment does well enough to go into a senior secondary school that's good? That's a good news story. But we don't hear about that. We hear about teachers siphoning funds. We, we hear all the negative stuff. You know, how about that teacher who's trying to teach... Um, uh, the students about a computer without a computer in the class, you know, so he draws it as best as he can, you know, and then uses that to teach the kids and it goes viral. And so he gets a donation from some foundation, you know, and, and that's a good news making do. And there are lots of them. There are lots of them, but we don't highlight them enough. We don't show that they're really great teachers in the system and we don't support them enough. So before long, they feel uncared for, unappreciated, and then they decide to leave. And then we are left with the crappy ones who are doing nothing. Have I lost you there? Hi, Rage. Is everybody still online? I think we, I've lost, I can't hear anything now. Are you there? Hi, I'm here. I lost you for a moment. Oh, right there. So let's let's hope let's hope you join shortly. Right there, you there? Uh, sorry, guys. Uh, okay. I uh, don't know what happened there. Can you all hear me and see me? Yeah, we can hear you. Yeah, we can hear you. Yeah. What was the last thing you heard me say, Rage? Uh, it was about um uh how uh you know um you know if if uh. If this was in a private sector, you know, uh, teachers not performing, you know, well would not be able to mm -hmm. sort of, uh, would not be allowed to keep their jobs. Yes. Okay. After that, I said, I think when you got cut off,
Yeah. I said that we must be able to communicate regularly with the populace about all that's happening in education, especially the good stories. Yeah. Because in the midst of all the, the chaos, we've got some really good teachers out there mm -hmm. who are doing amazing things. And I, I mentioned a young lady I came across on Facebook who yeah. um, was teaching in a village in the Volta region. And yes. the exam from Accra arrived very, very late. Did you hear that part? Or yes, you I heard about that? the uh, Volta, yeah. Okay, all right. So no need for me to, to go no. with that. No. But I'm just better instead of it always being the bad news that's reported. And then we need to find some way of rewarding great teachers. And mm -hmm. the rewards don't have to always be monetary. You know, there are all sorts of ways of rewarding teachers. I find that even during a staff meeting, um, just highlighting one teacher or a couple of teachers, yeah. that's, uh, that's a lot of reward. Yes. It shows them in front of their peers that you value them. You know, so highlighting them um, in that way, um, giving them uh, study opportunities, whether in country or outside of the country, um, uh, promotions, that sort of thing. There are all sorts of ways of rewarding them um, that will go quite a long ways as a, you know, compared to giving them money. Okay, um, that's a comprehensive uh, answer, uh, Mary, and thanks uh, for, you know, Filling it in from A, a to you know Z uh, mm -hmm. about um, you know uh, uh, you know about the importance of what we can do to train teachers uh, you know to be better teachers. Okay, now here's a food for thought uh, question: uh, What role does you know GIS and and TIS uh, and the likes of you? Know, we talked about this earlier. You know, Ashesi mm -hmm. uh, University play in developing confident and agile young adults for today's competitive market and how do they compare with our traditional outlets like you know uh, in Ghana like Motown and Wesley Girls? Okay um, students from these institutions they have access to the global education mindset. Mm -hmm. um, so right from the get-go it's that access uh, access to a certain mindset because they are likely being taught by well-trained teachers who've taught outside Africa so that exposure to research strategies you have a teacher who has had exposure to uh, teaching strategies that are well-researched and well-evaluated, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, different kinds of learning styles. They're likely using a curriculum too that's been well-designed and is comparable to global brands, right? So these internationally-minded schools need to contribute to the national conversation in a uniquely designed partnership. And that's a whole how that you need to check. And we want to compare them to our uh, what we call our traditional outlets or our local equivalents. I think it's that access to teachers who have an international mindset that could be the major difference there. Um, that that those students have, um, because you're you're going to be taught by you can be taught by a teacher who has not only lived outside the continent, they have worked outside the continent. And so they're able to bring their experiences to bear on whatever content they are delivering in class. Okay, that's, that's interesting. Um, a penultimate question uh, here, uh, Mary. Um, very broad one, uh, but um, you know, give us your thoughts. In your opinion, you know, can the African child compete on a global stage and what qualities define global competence? And I suppose in many ways, the first part of that question, we've, we've touched on the latter part about what qualities define global competence. But really, from your point of view, I suppose the really important bit is the first bit. In your opinion, can the African child compete on a global stage? Mm hmm. I don't know if you can hear me. I didn't hear that last part of what you said. Sorry. I was just saying, you know, the question is, in your opinion, can the African yes. child compete on a global stage? There's another part of the question which says, what qualities define global competence? But in a lot of ways, we've touched on that latter part of the uh, answer. So I, I suppose, you know, try and put the emphasis on the first part, which is, in your okay. opinion, can the African child compete on a global stage? Um, in my opinion, few African children on average can compete on the global stage yeah. um, because, you know, apart from academic competence, I, I think some things that the African child needs to develop, um, some basics that are needed are not being touched on mm -hmm. in the classroom, they're not being touched on by the curriculum, they're not being valued by being tested. Mm -hmm. And uh, the first one would be that they need to have a sense of and a pride 
in their own identity. Absolutely. You know, how many kids, you know, that you will meet today in Africa are proud of being Africans. Part of it is a media problem where all they see about Africa is just useless. So mm. why would I even want to be identified as such? So until that African child has that sense of identity, um, you can't build much on that will be sustainable. The second thing is uh, to be able to think critically. Mm -hmm. The third one, to display creativity and thought. Fourth one, display a certain international mindedness. You mm -hmm. cannot not have international mindedness and expect to compete globally, yeah. all right? We need to have it. We also need to be disciplined. That's a huge African problem, being disciplined, yeah. yes. you know? And we think, you know, <laughs> we think it all has to do with sit here and you sit, mm. but it, it's so much broader than that. So being yes. disciplined, being able to communicate effectively, mm. you know? When you're talking, are you giving eye contact? When you're talking, do you realize what your audience is and mm. how you are communicating to that audience? Do you know when to pause, when to start up a conversation again? Um, mm. All of these little, little things, do you know how to communicate effectively, whether yeah. in written or in oral format? And then that last one that you had mentioned earlier about being socially responsible. I think that until we can get these competencies or these attributes mm -hmm. together, right? There's no way, no way that the average African child can compete on the global, okay. on the okay. global, on global, global stage. Okay. Last question, uh, Mary, and we're coming up to the end of our session. Um, the quality and accessibility of education in Africa must be resolved before the situation can improve. Going back to UNESCO, which we started the whole session with, UNESCO warns that without urgent action, the situation will likely get worse as the region faces a rising demand for education due to a still growing school age population. What are your thoughts on how to get urgent action? Um. There needs to be, uh, starting off, some kind of an understanding of, of what that urgent action uh, mm. means. Mm -hmm. uh, while I was researching, I, I've written a paper that I think I provided a link to if anyone's interested in my engineering maintenance model for teaching. Mm -hmm. uh, but when I was researching that, um, found out that in the mining industry, when five miners die, it is considered a disaster, right? Mm -hmm. And a committee will be set up, all sorts of things will be put in place to investigate this, to ensure that this doesn't happen again. And if you do any research on mining, you'll, you'll know that uh, over the course of a century, the number of deaths from mining has decreased phenomenally. Uh, when it comes to the airline industry, you know, it only takes one point of crash and all of a sudden, airlines sales uh, air, air, flight sales will go all sorts of things. we don't want to lose anybody yeah we ask to say enough is enough you know, sense the urgency we need people to be sort in the desert we are enough is enough we mm. cannot continue going down it's bad you know, and it's been getting bad or worse, you know, over time. So this is so bad, we've got to do something about it. Um, I think that when bodies like UNESCO come up with this, somehow it doesn't, it doesn't trickle down enough for those who are stakeholders to take it seriously enough to do something urgent about it. So what would I do? I think that you know, while implementing an urgent plan, of course, you've got to have that overall gradual plan that will span like 10 to 15 years. And most countries will have that, um, the 2020 plan or the 2030 plan or whatever. So you've got that long-term vision um, that you're, you're, you're implementing alongside that urgent one. Now, there's a fabulous program that is all over the world. Mm -hmm. It started from America, Teach for America, right? There's Teach for England. There is now Teach for Ghana. I think the Teach for organization or the Teach for concept 
is in so many countries around the world. I can't tell you the numbers, but if you were to Google Teach for America um, and Teach for All, I think is a parent organization, you'll find that it's in several countries. So it started in Ghana probably about three, four years ago. And the whole concept of the, of the Teach for organization is that we will go out to universities, tertiary institutions, and look for our best students and say, for could you give us two years of your life, all right? A bit like what national service used to mean, okay? Could you give us two years of your life for us to train you, to, to, to mentor you, to, to manage you, all of that, and we'll send you to some of the poorest areas yeah. and you will work there for two years. And then after that, you're free to go, all yeah. right? So the lady who started doing this, Wendy, I can't remember her last name, but this was uh, her thesis, I think her master's or PhD thesis in the States. And she came up with this concept and uh, Teach for America was born. And she, her hope was that she would take these very bright um, graduates and they wouldn't want to leave the teaching field and we could train them. So you have your, your subject matter expertise right there already. And all you have to do is teach them how to teach, the art of teaching. Mm -hmm. Well, um, in the first couple of years, she was quite disappointed when she found out that not all of them were choosing to stay. In fact, very few were choosing to stay. So to her, that was a advice that that's not too bad because you know what? Those who went there for two years are now policymakers, they're now doctors, they're now yeah. lawyers, they're in civil society doing one thing or the other, but guess what? They are now advocates for education because they've been in the classroom. They know what it's like to stand in front of 30 kids or 60 kids in some part of Africa and try to yeah. teach them something without any resources. Now this started in America and they sent these graduates to some of the poorest neighborhoods in America. And they started seeing the changes that were happening. And uh, because of this, this organization has grown and it's all over. And we have Teach for Ghana. Mm -hmm. And in mm -hmm. three years of existence, it is phenomenal what Teach for Ghana has done. If you go to their website, you see all the stats there. For me, this is something that we could do urgently. Go to the universities just flow that vision say do you want your country doing this that 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 do you want us competing on the global stage do you want to be proud of who we are where we are well you know what give me two years of your life give me two years of your life i'll pay you a living wage and get that living wage from government can contribute i know government doesn't contribute to teach for ghana i think uh, but it's it's uh, private private organizations that do that. Foundations hmm. are doing that, and they're paying these graduates something that allows them to be able to focus on teaching. They partner these teachers with qualified uh, teachers, who I call master teachers, and these graduates do it for two years. And after two years, some of them will choose to stay, and some of them will leave, and that's okay. Those who stay can continue the work. And those who leave will now be advocates for what's most important in the classroom. Okay. Mary, thank you very much uh, indeed. That draws to an end our uh, session for this weekend. Um, uh, gentlemen and ladies uh, who've been uh, joining us, we've been uh, had the uh, honor of uh, speaking to uh, Mary Apia Ashun. Hello, can you hear me, everyone? Yes, I can, I can hear you. Yeah, we've yeah. got, uh, you know, we've had Mary Apia Ashun, who's headmistress of Ghana International School in Ghana, um, who's given her time to us this evening to tell us about the importance of uh, education uh, and how we can educate the African child so that he or she can compete globally. Mary, thank you very much indeed. Thank you so much, Raghe. I had a fabulous time. Thank you for, for letting me talk incessantly about something that I care very much about. So grateful for the opportunity. Thanks so much. And um, to everyone else out there, keep supporting the teachers in your children's lives. Um, we know how important they are. Many of us are where we are because we had a great teacher. So let's keep doing all we can to support them and to support policies that ensure that we get the very best people in our classrooms. Let's encourage our own kids to become teachers. All right? That's where it starts, parents. Yeah. Tell them. And Mary, um, from... Yeah. 
you get and summers of, off and you get and holidays like Christmas, Easter. <laughs> and Mary, on behalf of Business Links, Business Links, uh, we have to say a big thank you for taking the time out to prepare to host this session. It'll be very informative, and um, I'm sure people will also take time to watch the video if they didn't join us at this point. Rage, thanks a lot. Not at all, Steve. Thank you. Very, very, very busy all schedule. the best. You guys are doing a phenomenal job. Thank you very much. We can, we'll continue in, the, in that fashion. So wonderful. I think we can end the session now. Um, okay. Thank you all, and uh, we'll catch up later. Okay. Thank you. Bye bye. All right then. Bye. 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 bye.